grace and peace and welcome to Eastminster Presbyterian Church this morning as we worship together on this rainy Sunday, both here in the sanctuary as well as gathered online. If you could please take a moment to pass the act of friendship pad located along the center aisle, taking note of who is worshiping beside you so you can greet them by name following worship. A few announcements to highlight directly after the service today. We'll have our rally day picnic that will be downstairs. Uh, so even if you didn't sign up, you can still come. So uh, please consider coming. As part of that picnic, we'll be having a fishbowl raffle. I think I saw like 22 different items that you can, uh, ba- different gift baskets that you can uh, buy a ticket and try and win um, that gift basket. There's lots of different things down there. There was music tickets. Randy, where were those music tickets from that you could... American Music Theater from the choir. I saw some Lowe's gift cards down there. I saw a hand-turned bowl. All sorts of uh, wonderful things that you can uh, bid on. Some puzzles and all sorts of other uh, great stuff. Um, So you can go downstairs uh, following worship today. Also, uh, while you're at it, you can sign up to have your photo taken Uh, for the church directory. There's a couple ways you can do that. There is a QR code uh, in the bulletin that you can take a picture of that uh, with your phone and go to the website and sign up that way. Or uh, Bethann will be downstairs. Is that correct, Bethann? Bethann will be downstairs and you can sign up uh, with her through the computer down there and set up an appointment to be part of the, the photo directory. It's really important that we get as many folks uh, here for that and get their photos in that directory. Let us come together as the body of Christ and let us worship God as one. Please join in the responsive call to worship. Crowds gathered to hear Jesus speak of pain, the pain of losing something precious. Crowds gathered to hear Jesus speak of joy, the joy of finding what was lost. We gather to hear Jesus speak words of truth, words of power, words of love. Speak now, O Lord for your servants are listening.
There is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let the sound of our confession cause celebration in heaven. Let us confess our sin together. Create in us clean hearts, O God. Cast out any transgressions you find there. Ransack, renovate, redecorate. Deep in our hearts, remove fearful features and restore your original design. The old lamps are dim. Bring new light into the darkness. Make your dwelling place deep in our hearts and teach us wisdom so the hearts you transform may rejoice. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners. Believe the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are redeemed. Peace of Christ be with you. Please turn and share that peace in ways you feel comfortable. any kids they could come forward oh you're going for the hug okay go for the hug too here but you can come up too sweet how we doing hey charlie bug how you doing man i love the outfit that is like the new business casual right there that's what that is so how we doing guys we good okay yeah. Question for you guys. Have you ever lost anything? Yeah. 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 Every, day. Every day. Every day you lose something. Yes. Yeah. And what happens when you lose something? I angry. You might get upset. Yeah. You might get upset. Do you look for it? Yeah. You look for it. Yeah. Like a special Lego you might lose. Yeah. That might cause a lot of consternation, right? At times, yeah. I remember one time I lost something. So I was in college, um, and I was still living with Gigi and Grandpa. Um, and I came um, back to the Philadelphia area for uh, the fall for, for school. And so I had just driven seven hours. You guys have done that drive a lot, right? You know, it's not an easy drive. So I pulled into the parking lot of the apartment I was going to live in. And guess what I did not have with me? What gets you into a house? My keys. My keys. Not a code. They didn't have codes back then. Um, my keys. I didn't have my keys. So I had driven all that way, and I couldn't find my keys. And so you know what I did? I pulled all the bags out of my car, and I looked through all my bags, and I couldn't find the keys. And so then what do you do 
if that happens. I called a locksmith and paid the guy about $200 in cash. A crowbar, crowbar. The landlord would not have liked the crowbar. But I paid a guy about $200 in cash, and then he let me in the apartment. He did not give me another key. Um, and guess what happened? The next day, guess what I found in the car? My keys. They were in between the seat and the door. They had kind of fallen under the seat. Yeah. So, Jesus tells a story, and he tells this story about a woman who had how many? Ten coins, and she loses one of them. What do you think she does? She looks for it. She pulls everything out of her house. She sweeps the house. Can you guys sweep? Sweep motion? Yeah, yeah. she sweeps the house. Yeah, just like that. These guys are expert sweepers. Um, she sweeps the house, and you know what she finds? Her coin. What do you think she does then? She, she buys stuff. Yeah, she probably eventually bought stuff with it. But she celebrates. She invites all her friends over and say, hey, the thing that I lost, it's found. It's kind of like when you guys lose that Lego, and you find it. You walk around the house, and you say, hey, I found my Lego, right? Yeah, yeah. So Jesus was telling that story to tell us a little bit about God. That sometimes we're lost and God finds us. Would you guys pray with me? Dear Jesus, we thank you that you find us. In Christ's name, amen. Dude, you guys rock. Love you. It's interesting, this Exodus reading. So the lectionary sets these two readings together. And the Exodus reading and the Luke reading, they read very differently. And it's part of what we get to celebrate as we read scripture, is to see how people began to understand God throughout scripture. Reading from Exodus chapter 32. God spoke to Moses, Go, get down there. Your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have fallen to pieces. In no time at all, they turned away from the way I commanded them. They made a molten calf and worshiped it. They sacrificed to it and said, These are the gods of Israel that brought you up from the land of Egypt. God said to Moses, I look at this people. Oh, what a stubborn, hard-headed people. Let me alone. Give my anger free reign to burst into flames and incinerate them. But I'll make a great nation out of you, Moses. So Moses tried to calm his God down. He said, why God? Why would you lose your temper with your people? Why? You brought them out of Egypt in a tremendous demonstration of power and strength. Why let the Egyptians say he had it in for them? He brought them out so he could just kill them in the mountains, wipe them off of the face of the earth. Stop your anger. Think twice about bringing evil against your people. Think of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, your servants to whom you gave your word, telling them, I will give you many children, as many as the stars in the sky, and I'll give you this land, this land to your, you and your children forever and ever. And God did think twice. God decided not to do the evil he threatened against his people.
So wonderful to have the choir back. <clears throat> Reading from Luke chapter 15. By this time, a lot of men and women of questionable reputations were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and the religious scholars were not pleased, not pleased at all. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like they are old friends. And their grumbling is what triggered this story or this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness to go after the lost one until you found it? When found, you can be sure you would put it on your shoulders, rejoicing you would go home, call in your friends and neighbors saying, celebrate with me, I've lost my sheep. Count on it. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner rescued, rescued life than over 99 good people in no need of rescue. Or imagine a woman who has 10 coins and loses one coin. Won't she light a lamp and scour the house, looking at every nook and cranny until she finds the coin? And when she finds it, you can be sure she will call all her friends and her neighbors, celebrate with me. I lost my coin. Count on it. That's the kind of parties God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Open us, eternal God. Open us to hear your word, that as your word is read, as your word is sung, as your word is proclaimed. Help us not to turn from your truth, but to avoid distracting our distractions. Help us to be receptive to the wisdom that you offer us this day. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. A little over a decade ago, Forrest Fenn published a memoir called The Thrill of the Chase. If you're not familiar with Forrest Fenn, he's a controversial figure he could best be described as a modern Indiana Jones. He quite literally made a career out of finding artifacts and then reselling these artifacts. And in his memoir, he decided to create more controversy. He did something. He published in that memoir 
a 24-line poem that was a treasure map. You see, Forrest Fenn in his late 70s was diagnosed with cancer. And he had the idea of writing this poem and having it be a treasure map and then taking a box quite literally of gold coins into the woods and dying alongside this box. But he recovered from cancer and published the poem and hid about a million to two million dollars in the woods. As you can imagine, people were interested in this poem. A prize like this caused all sorts of people to begin searching. He said that the prize was somewhere in Wyoming or Montana, that region of the world. But people began looking in all sorts of areas, trying to follow this poem to figure out where this treasure chest was. What Fenn had always maintained is that it was actually in a fairly easy place to locate, that even a child, if they read the poem, could find it. He hid this box when he was 80 years old, carrying 40, a 40 to 50 pound box into the wilderness, filled with these gold coins and other items. But nevertheless, people began to search in all sorts of places, some of them taking extreme risks. Four people actually died in pursuit of this treasure. They think at different points in time, there was over 3,000 people searching for it. Hundreds of people literally needed to be rescued as they were looking for this treasure from canyons, rivers, extreme uh, weather, and mountainsides. One gentleman had a 200-foot rope, and he was trying to rappel down a 500-foot cliff and he needed to be rescued. The park, um, the park Service was actually relieved when the treasure was finally found. It was found by a guy named Jack Stwife. He was a 30-year-old uh, who spent three years, as he said, literally reading the poem every single day. Every single day for three years, he thought about where this treasure might be. He consulted some of the blogs, listened to all of Forrest's recordings and his writings, and spent 25 days in the wilderness searching for this treasure. And he found that box. He said when he found it, it wasn't like you would think in the movies. It wasn't suddenly the heavens opened. But it was suddenly, yeah, whoever did that. <laughs> it was just he found a treasure. He won't reveal the location. Forrest Fenn has since passed away. And Jack does not want this to become sort of pilgrimage location. So nobody knows where it was found other than it was in the state of Wyoming. Jesus tells us these two stories about things that are lost. He begins this story by telling us he's going to tell us one story, but he actually tells us three. The story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son or the prodigal son. This is a trilogy of parables that is considered the heart of the gospel of Luke. That if we want to understand Luke, we need to look at these three parables. It can always be difficult to reflect on parables that we might have heard about for years. But I think if we come to this with an open mind, we might be able to gain a little more insight into these the first question we need to wrestle with is, why is Jesus even telling these parables? 
The text is pretty clear that there is a group of people that are grumbling. These religious leaders, these Pharisees are upset by who is being attracted to Jesus' teachings. They're upset because the wrong people are showing up. The wrong people are being attracted to Jesus, wanting to hear him. And it's interesting to know because these are the religious teachers, the leaders of the day, people who are supposed to understand the grace and love of God. And they're the ones who are trying to make the grace and love of God exclusive, trying to keep others out. But yet these tax collectors and sinners come, people who were despised during their day, tax collectors because they were considered traitors because they had aligned themselves with Rome, and sinners, a general category. This could be anything from someone who committed a crime to somebody who simply violated a purity law. But they have come, and they are unacceptable. They don't behave or believe properly. So they're not supposed to be there. This should cause some self-reflection when we hear this parable. Who is it that we would be uncomfortable with if they came in those doors and sat in our sanctuary or came downstairs for our picnic? Is it a group of people? Is it a person? You have to answer this for yourself. Maybe it's somebody of a different, different political party. Maybe a Democrat or a Republican. Maybe it's a person in a different life stage than you. Maybe a rich person, a poor person, someone who doesn't speak English, someone who looks different, someone who might love differently. The next question we have to ask is who is even lost? What is the criteria for being in and out? Who is present there in this moment? And we have to ask our own community, who's represented in our fellowship? Who is missing from our own community? Do we reflect our neighborhood and those around us? And if we don't, we have to ask the question, why is that? Is there something that we're doing that excludes others? I think you can tell a lot about a church by who they consider lost. Years ago, um, at my first call, we uh, had developed a partnership with a ministry in Mexico. It was one of these uh, hybrid organizations. It was in Reynosa, Mexico. It was a church that met several days a week, as well as a housing ministry where they quite literally built homes in uh, Reynosa. There was lots of folks showing up in that area from all over the world. And as you can imagine, they don't have building codes there. Uh, so quite literally, they were putting homes where they could put homes. People would do labor and work and eventually would be able to get a one-room house that they could add on. We got to know this director quite well. The church got deeply involved in this ministry. We would sponsor two homes to be built, and then typically we would go down uh, once a year and help build a home. All of it was done out of poured concrete and block. I had the pleasure of taking a middle school group down once. We joined up with about 60 other people to pour about five roofs that uh, week. It was amazing to be with those kids, to mix concrete in the dirt, and to put that on the roof and give people a place to live. But we were traveling together as a youth group, 
and we were in the airport, and it was always interesting traveling through an airport with a group of 20 or 30 kids. If you've never done it, I highly recommend it. Um, and it was always fun if we saw another youth group because this other youth leader and I would try and get to know them and say hello to them, especially if they were near our gate. I have a fond memory of playing balloon volleyball with another youth group in the airport. Um, I think the people around us did not find it as fun as we did, but we had a great time. But on this trip as we were going to Mexico, I remember there was this other group that was there. We didn't know them. They had these green matching t-shirts on. That was generally how you found the youth group. They had matching t-shirts on. And I'll never forget this. They were going to their terminal. They were going to Mexico. And I remember looking at their shirts. I don't know who made them. But the back of the shirt said, bringing God to Mexico. And then it had the year. One of my students, Kinsey, uh, was a senior at the time. I remember her leaning over to me saying, don't they know God is already in Mexico? <laughs> but you can tell a lot about a group on who they think is lost. It's also fascinating in this parable to see who does the seeking, who is doing the looking in this parable. Jesus is kind of being offensive in this moment. We miss some of this culturally, but Jesus is definitely riling up the crowd, trying to get a reaction out of them. In the first parable, he talks about the hundred sheep and one that is missing. This would have represented a sizable investment for somebody with having a hundred sheep. And it's pretty clear from the parable that God, Jesus, is the sheep, uh, is the shepherd in this parable. That God is doing the seeking. We don't know if he's the owner of the sheep or not, but it is God who is the shepherd. The thing, though, is during this time period, shepherds did not have a great reputation. Shepherds were considered thieves and drifters. So we have Jesus comparing God to a thief and a drifter in this moment. It kind of starts to change the way you hear this parable when you hear it this way. Or the second parable, a woman has 10 coins, loses one. And this time God transforms from a shepherd to a woman searching her home looking for a coin. And this is consistent in the way Jesus taught his parables. He often used examples in which he paired them together, a male shepherd and a woman, a rich person and a poor person. And this comparison, especially during this time period, would have been even more riling up, even more offensive than calling God a shepherd. In this time period, women were powerless. They had no standing. So Jesus is comparing God to someone with no standing, with no power, and saying that is who is searching for us. We don't know why Jesus is agitating these leaders. I think what Jesus is trying to do in this moment is expand what they're thinking about, trying to get them to think differently about the culture they live in, the world they live in, the way that they understand God, and the way that they relate to God. We also have to wrestle with the question, are we lost or are we found? Most of us, when we read this parable, we immediately identify with being one of the 99 sheep or one of the nine coins. If we read the parable that way, though, 
it suddenly becomes about how do we treat the lost person? How do we treat the person who is lost? And we end up in the seeking or the welcoming aspect. But that kind of interpretation and that mentality leads to a moral superiority. It leads to a gatekeeping mentality. Suddenly, we become the ones who get to decide if that lost sheep gets to come in. We get to decide if that lost coin is found. That only if you have the correct beliefs, if you approach God in the right way, then you can come. And the church for generations has fallen into this trap where there's been the criteria in order to come in. And I would suggest that what Jesus is getting at in this parable, in this story, is that we are all lost sheep. That we are all lost coins. Sheep and coins that need to be found. Even if we've been sitting in a pew for decades, we were at one point found by God. And it's not a one-time thing. God keeps seeking after us. God keeps looking for us as we wander away, as we hide parts of ourselves from God. God comes looking for us when we fail, when we say the wrong thing, when we hurt someone. God searches for us, not counting the cost, but rejoicing, rejoicing at every restoration. Let us pray. God who perpetually seeks us out, may we be your people who are found by you. May we always remember that we are lost sheep and lost coins. Only here by your grace. In Christ's name, amen.
us remain standing as we affirm our faith together by reading from the Confession of 1967. The life, death, resurrection, and promised coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His human life involves the church in common life of all people. His service to men and women commits the church to every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering so that it sees the face of Christ in the faces of persons in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the churches God's judgment on the inhumanity that marks human relations and the awful consequences of the church's own complicity in injustice. In the power of the risen Christ and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of human life in society and of God's victory over all wrong. The church follows this pattern in the form of its life and in the method of its actions. So to live and serve is to confess Christ as Lord. Please be seated. In a moment, we'll take our offering. You may need to slide in. We've gone to having two ushers um, receive the offering. Our God is a great and generous God. Let us give and live generously in response to all that God has done for us. Let us offer our gifts and our lives. Holy God, how often we take for granted all that we have. How often we fail to recognize how blessed we are. Take these gifts we give in response to your generosity and use them to further Christ's mission and ministry in a hurting world. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated.
Lots of folks that we continue to be in prayer for. Remember that you can submit a prayer concern by calling or emailing the office or dropping a prayer card in the offering plate. We're in prayer for Miranda Bowersox and Baby Journey, Jody Geiger, uh, Jim May, who was at worship earlier today, Lois Moore, Fran Mount, Kathy Mount Purcell, Donna and Eddie Thomas, Joe Watson, and Chuck Winders. I also want to thank the congregation and all those folks that helped yesterday with uh, Dave McIntosh's service. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, tribute to him and to uh, his life, and I know the family deeply felt the warmth of the congregation with everything that was done for them, so I'm deeply grateful uh, for that. Also, if I was hoping she would be up here, but if you see Jan Tratner, I'm guessing she is downstairs, um, please give this opportunity to say thank you to her. Uh, Jan is moving, um, and uh, she's moving to be closer to her kids, and she has just done some amazing things um, over the last few years, helping so much with the hospitality of the church. Um, and so if you see Jan, I'm guessing she's downstairs, uh, please say thank you and uh, um, take a moment just to thank her for everything she's done. Let us go to God in prayer. We gather together today, God, by your prompting, by the prompted, prompting of your spirit, drawn to this sanctuary by your will and your desire for us to worship together as a community. Each of us is connected as a family of faith, related by our common bonds together. And each of us today brings our own brings to worship our own burdens and our own cares. Burdens and cares that you know about in our hearts, but burdens and cares that are not always named. In your mercy, O oh God, we ask you to hear our prayers, to hear our prayers this day for your world, for our community, for our nation, and your church. We pray for the people of Ukraine, and we pray for other incidents of violence around the world. God, we ask you to end the violence and all the ways that violence is used as oppression to control and coerce. We pray for peace and justice to rule your world. And God, we pray who, for those that are on the front lines of that violence. God, deliver them. Keep them safe. God, we pray for those that are hungry, those that are houseless, those that are sick, those who live in a world of abundance but are struggling. God, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for restructuring of economies, of relief, so that all your people may flourish. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for this nation. This day, as we remember the pain and loss of September 11th, every anniversary should be an anniversary for prayer, for remembrance of a living grief. We pray for the generations affected by this tragedy, those who still harbor trauma, and those who grieve the loss. We pray for the innocents who witness violence, Lord, hear our prayers. Turn us wholeheartedly to your path of peace, O oh God. And God, we, we pray for so many different situations. Floods that continue to decimate homes and lives, wildfires that rage, storms that devastate. God, your creation. Your creation is powerful and worthy of our respect. Help us to care for our planet as our precious home. Encourage our leaders towards initiatives that help heal the environment. Help those among us, the poorest among us, that are affected by these natural disasters. 
Help us all to remember our responsibility to you, to each other, and to the planet. And God, we lift up these concerns, these concerns that we, you have laid on our hearts, both those unspoken and spoken concerns. We pray for Miranda and Journey, for Jody, for Jim, for Lois, for Fran, for Kathy, for Donna and Eddie, for Joe, for Chuck. We thank you for all those people who help to minister to Dave's family and show the body of Christ to them. And God, we thank you for Jan. We thank you for all that she's done and been in this community, the leadership that she has shown over the years. United as the community of faith, as the body of Christ, oh God, we lift these prayers to you our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. Hear us as we join our hearts and voices together in praying the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We hope that you will join us downstairs for our uh, picnic together. Um, it, to get downstairs, there's a couple different ways. You can go through this door, which I think is the door they're preferring, because I saw some things set up there, or the door in that back right-hand corner. If you'd like to avoid stairs, uh, you can take a car and drive a car around to that point. And there's a set of double doors uh, that will get you down there. Um, and on to an Olivet. Thanks be to God for the God who searches for the lost. May the grace, hope, and peace and love of God the Redeemer, creator and sustainer be with us all now and forever. Amen. Amen.